What's that? You say you still haven't subscribed to our new Hacking Humans podcast? Well, get on it, friend. We released a new episode today. TimeHop releases more information as its breach investigation proceeds. Two speculative execution side channel attacks are described in the lab, not yet in the wild. The U.S. Senate's flesh creeps over bug disclosure practices. Someone uses a Netgear exploit to get some U.S. technical manuals. And Twitter goes to work against bogus accounts. It's time for a message from our sponsor, Recorded Future. You've heard of Recorded Future. They're the real-time threat intelligence company. Their patented technology continuously analyzes the entire web to give InfoSec analysts unmatched insight into emerging threats. We subscribe to and read their Cyber Daily. They do some of the heavy lifting and collection and analysis that frees you to make the best informed decisions possible for your organization. Sign up for the Cyber Daily email and every day you'll receive the top results for trending technical indicators that are crossing the web. Cyber news, targeted industries, threat actors, exploited vulnerabilities, malware, suspicious IP addresses, and much more. Subscribe today and stay ahead of the cyber attacks. Go to recordedfuture.com slash intel and subscribe for free threat intelligence updates from Recorded Future. It's timely, it's solid, and the price is right. It's recordedfuture.com slash intel, and we thank Recorded Future for sponsoring our show. Major funding for the CyberWire podcast is provided by Silence. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Thursday, July 12, 2018. The time hop breach disclosed over the past week seems to have gotten worse. The service acknowledged that dates of birth, gender of customers, and country codes were also compromised. For GDPR purposes, the records that fall within the scope of the European Privacy Regulation include 2.9 million name and email address combinations, as well as 2.2 million name, email address, and date of birth records. The timeline of the breach is interesting. The incident began on December 19th of last year, when an unauthorized party used a TimeHop admin's credentials to log in to a third-party cloud account. The hacker subsequently created a new admin account and logged in three more times, quietly looking for personally identifying information. By the time of the fourth login, enough PII had been moved into the cloud to make it worthwhile. The hacker then waited until July 4th, an American and not a European holiday, one notes, presumably expecting a relaxed guard over the holidays, and logged in to steal the database. The case is also interesting for what it will ultimately reveal about how the European Information Commissioner will balance zeal in reporting against completeness of reporting, TimeHop disclosed the incident swiftly, shortly after discovering it on the 4th, but they were forced to issue updates to their disclosure over the last two days. The information commissioner has been blogging, in a spirit of firmness but fairness, that while there's no grace period for compliance, since everyone has had two years to prepare, the EU is committed to being reasonable. As the commissioner's blog puts it, quote, We pride ourselves on being a fair and proportionate regulator, and this will continue under GDPR. Those who self-report, who engage with us to resolve issues, and who can demonstrate effective accountability arrangements can expect this to be taken into account when we consider any regulatory action. The past few years have seen a migration of data to the cloud as organizations take advantage of potential cost savings, security, and convenience. But how can you be sure your cloud-based data is fully compliant with regulations like GDPR? Yaniv Avidan is CEO and co-founder of MinerEye, where they claim their interpretive AI-based technology can assist with these sorts of tasks. Specifically, when looking at uh, the number of companies that are migrating data to the cloud, or generally speaking, adopting cloud uh, infrastructure or services, we see public cloud services are growing, you know, exponentially year over year, uh, specifically with big companies such as uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Salesforce, and Google, uh, and several others. Uh, so that's on one hand, we see the race to the cloud, 
which basically what is motivated by you know cost saving and productivity right mm-hmm. on the other hand we see gdpr that in a collision kind of route with this kind of vector since it actually limits or provides some regulation on top of data that affects the cloud migration uh, activities now where do people usually find themselves getting in trouble when it comes to cloud adoption and how that could bump up against GDPR? First and foremost, where is my sensitive data located? So data residency, which is a explicit requirement by GDPR. You need to be able to uh, continuously at any point of time point on the data that is a, a personal data and its location, either for purposeful use proof or for right to be forgotten request or subject request to delete their data or to uh, hand over their data and so on. Other requirements had to do have to do with the protection of that data in specific use cases. For instance, if my data is going out of an EU geography, I need it needs to be protected and handled accordingly. Okay, and again, this has to be uh, has to do with the location of the data. Or let's say the data needs to be well segregated based on geographies, but not just based on geographies, but also based on use. So it all comes into the point of identifying the data and its location uh, with, with respect to the specific uh, requirement that uh, is defined by GDPR. So what are your recommendations to make sure that they uh, are in compliance? Raise awareness internally within companies as to personal data handling. Um, awareness and training is the first thing People need to be aware that they uh, hold some very sensitive information and be very careful about what they do with it, who they send it to, what kind of use they do with the data. For instance, if this is a customer data, personal data, and me incorporating that into a marketing presentation, this is something that uh, needs to be uh, realized. I mean, needs to be uh, the customer or the people that handling the data needs to be aware of it. Second, we uh, companies need to shift how they identify and how they store data and understand that this, these processes need to uh, shift between the manual approaches or traditional approaches uh, used up until now to some uh, very advanced approaches leveraging artificial intelligence. Because we are talking about huge amount of data, right? And we talk about a major effect on the company once you break the law. And and the difference now is that GDPR becomes a law, right, rather than a directive. So I think shift in how uh, using and handling personal data, using advanced technologies in order to uh, cover much more areas and unstructured data specifically, because this was a, a black box or, or weak points for every company, that would be a good start. That's Yaniv Avidan from Minor Eye. Two new attack techniques similar to Spectre have been identified. These speculative execution side-channel attacks are researchers' discoveries, not attacks being observed in the wild. ARM, AMD, and Intel chipsets are all susceptible to the attacks. Speculative execution is a common and important feature of contemporary chip design, so any methods of exploiting it will have widespread impact. Intel, which paid a bug bounty of $100,000 to the researchers, has offered advice on mitigating the issue. ARM says most of its chips are probably unaffected, but it has mitigation suggestions as well. AMD is still considering the matter, but will probably have its own recommendations available shortly. The report of the new speculative execution issues roughly coincides with U.S. congressional hearings on Spectre and Meltdown. The Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation deliberated the matter yesterday, and the discussion might count as a contribution to the larger issues of responsible disclosure, information sharing, and vulnerability equities. While industry had become aware of the issues and discussed it within industry channels, the chipmakers apparently did not inform the U.S. Department of Homeland Security or any other responsible federal agency. The feds found out about it in January, when the rest of us did, at the time of public disclosure. But customers and partners learned of Spectre and Meltdown first. Intel shared the discovery with Chinese companies it partners with, 
An ARMS chief marketing officer told the committee directly that they began sharing with affected customers within 10 days of learning about the problem. ARMS Joyce Kim said, quote, We do have architecture customers in China that we were able to notify to work with them on the mitigations. End quote. It's difficult to fault a company for wanting to take care of its customers, and there's little to no evidence that Chinese intelligence services actively exploited either Spectre or Meltdown. But the possibility that some of the Chinese firms would have passed the disclosure on to their government before DHS so much has got wind of it has given several senators an understandable case of the heebie-jeebies. At the very least, it would seem that some aspects of public-private information sharing still need to be worked out. Manuals covering various items of U.S. equipment have been found offered for sale on the dark web. The systems covered include the MQ-9 Reaper drone and the M1 Abrams main battle tank, two weapons that have been in use for some time. According to Recorded Future, the asking price was only $200, but since sales appear to have been slow, they were knocked down recently to $150. The person responsible, described by Naked Security as a sad sack, apparently had no real understanding of what he or she had, what it was worth, or where to sell it. But the sad sack knew enough to find Netgear routers with password admin and follow familiar steps to exploit an FTP vulnerability, change the password, and get access. Some of the material appears to have been stolen from a U.S. Air Force captain. Other material is openly available from Defense Department sites. In truth, the material doesn't appear to be particularly valuable, or the kind of thing that would be difficult for a determined service to obtain, although a hobbyist or buff might want it for a collection. None of it is likely to be classified, but some of it at least was restricted from distribution to foreigners. So perhaps hacker Sadsack didn't have his or her price point off too far after all. And finally, Twitter has set about purging bogus accounts and bots spawned from troll farms. If you were among those who pride themselves on the quantity as opposed to the quality of your followers, and we're looking at you, middle schoolers, you may find to your dismay that all those people from St. Petersburg who were hanging on your every word are soon to be gone, gone with the wind. That's St. Petersburg, Russia, of course. Your grandparents in St. Petersburg, Florida, still love you as much as always. Now a moment to tell you about our sponsor, ThreatConnect. With ThreatConnect's in-platform analytics and automation, you'll save your team time while making informed decisions for your security operations and strategy. Find threats, evaluate risk, and mitigate harm to your organization. ThreatConnect offers a suite of products designed for teams of all sizes and maturity levels. Built on the ThreatConnect platform, the products provide adaptability as your organization changes and grows. Want to learn more? Check out their newest paper entitled, More is Not More, Busting the Myth that More Threat Intel Feeds Lead to Better Security. It's a common misconception that a large quantity of threat intelligence feeds leads to more effective security. Unfortunately, threat feed overindulgence can lead to confusion, disorganization, and inaccurate threat reports. Instead of adding more threat intel feeds, you should incorporate the feeds that provide the most value to your company's security operations. Find the paper or to register for a free ThreatConnect account, visit threatconnect.com slash cyberwire. And we thank ThreatConnect for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Mike Benjamin. He's a senior director of threat research at CenturyLink. Mike, welcome back. Um, we wanted to touch base on crypto jacking, where we stand today, ways to defend yourself against it. What can you share with us? So the world can't help but have heard of crypto mining or cryptocurrency. And so the act of creating a, a digital currency and trading it, whether it be for the purposes of you know separating from a government or anonymized transactions, whatever the goal of the coin is, there's a lot of you know good and bad that have come from the creation of these. Mm. And as with any type of money in the world, people want to steal it, they want to create it, they want to make money and take advantage of a new system that's in place. And so for a number of years, it was relatively easy to go out and buy some hardware and mine a cryptocurrency. 
Bitcoin mining was very popular for a number of years, and people were making relatively easy money by doing that. Evolved today, that's no longer the case. And so the cost of, you see a GPU on Amazon that you need to go buy, the cost has gone through the roof. And it's extremely expensive, time-consuming, and ultimately power-consuming in order to mine a cryptocurrency. So a few things have happened. The first is that the actors have taken advantage of a similar thing to what they do with any botnet, where they try to take advantage of thousands, hundreds of thousands of infected computers across the internet to do their bidding. And so if you can imagine the cost of a GPU or the cost of power to mine a single Bitcoin, imagine if you could get 100,000 machines to support you in doing that. Now, unfortunately, in the case of Bitcoin, it's still not very profitable. However, another currency known as Monero has been useful. And so we actually see JavaScript miners being deployed inside websites. And so cryptojacking really is the concept of taking over a user's browser, hijacking their resources, hence the name cryptojacking, and getting it to do their bidding and make them a few dollars. And so while that tab is open in a browser, while that JavaScript is executing, it is doing mining in Monero and making that actor money. Now, I've seen some interesting uh, approaches to this where some organizations have said, hey, you know, instead of showing you an ad, how about you let us use your GPU for a while and, uh, and that'll be the deal that we strike. Yeah, it's actually interesting. And, and so I think it's a bit exciting to see you know, new economic opportunities where websites are very open about what they're doing. Unfortunately, when we describe the crypto jacking side, it's a malicious actor. And mm-hmm. so whether they are doing malvertising injection of that that code or whether they've actually broken into a website in order to deliver it, they've got a lot of criminal ways they're attempting to achieve it. But there's obviously a very interesting economic opportunity for websites to be using a small amount of resources. We, we've actually seen some of the criminal actors utilize some, call it discretion in how they've been utilizing this. Because if you think about crypto coin mining and its CPU intensity, it can slow down a computer. And so nobody wants their computer to be slow while they're doing their day-to-day activity. And so these actors have taken upon themselves to use less than 100% of resources, look for idle interaction on the machine, and do a number of things where they're not actually impacting the user experience as they're doing their criminal activities. And I imagine the advertising world or the, uh, the website operator world will utilize the same methodology when they're looking to make profits through it. So they don't they don't want to draw attention to themselves by having the fans spin up uh, when you load that that browser uh, that browser window. I'm curious, um, how are the developers of the browsers responding to this? Are they building in ways to detect it and block it? Well, we've seen a lot of different methods out there that folks are looking to develop. First, in you know, from a security perspective, we we obviously have to touch on first the the security world is doing a relatively good job of going out. Uh, with either emulated browsers or just simple spiders and looking for websites that have had this injected report on them, some cases block them, in some cases develop extensions for browsers that inform the user that they're about to interact with it, similar to any sort of browsing methodology. The other is that the natural evolution of solving bugs inside of your computer is to isolate processes from each other and never allow a single process to impact the overall machine. So just through the natural evolution of what we see from keeping a computer stable, we're adding in mitigations and technology into the computer that can allow a single miner or a single interaction with a a crypto miner to not bring down the computer, slow it down, or like we said, impact the user experience. All right. Well, it's interesting stuff as always. Mike Benjamin, thanks for joining us. And that's the CyberWire. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially to our sustaining sponsor, Silence. To find out how Silence can help protect you using artificial intelligence, visit Silance.com. And Silence is not just a sponsor, we actually use their products to help protect our systems here at the CyberWire. And thanks to our supporting sponsor, VMware, creators of Workspace ONE Intelligence. Learn more at VMware.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technology. Our show is produced by Pratt Street Media with editor John Petrick, social media editor Jennifer Ivan, technical editor Chris Russell, executive editor Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening.